Good morning. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Klaus, for inviting me to uh, present here. Um, the, I was also at the very first SLTBR meeting, not at the founding meeting, which I think Bud, Norm, and Michael were at, but the first um, annual meeting held 27 years ago in Bethesda. Um, it was very meaningful to be part of this organization where, as a first-year fellow, one can do research, work with you know, world-class researchers, and then present uh, those data in a forum like this and get feedback from across the whole world. So it's, it's very meaningful for me to be uh, here again uh, at an SLTBR meeting. Um, Michael asked me to speak on the topic of the biology of circadian rhythms. And so I'll begin with a, a philosophical point. Uh, with regard to this, some of you I'm sure are more expert in, in this topic than I am, um, but I really pr intend to present this as an, at an overview level because this is uh, a teaching course. Now again, the instructions to me were to think in terms of the biology of circadian rhythms, but from a philosophical background, um, I'll read you a quote from Ernest Rutherford, the father of nuclear physics. What he wrote was, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. Sadly, I'm not a physicist, and this isn't the right forum to go over physics, but I think to the extent that um, we as researchers keep the physics in the back of our mind, uh, the more it will have uh, to inform us. But as I, as I said, I'm not a physicist, so I'll be presenting to you confessions of a stamp collector. Um, which I am. In particular, this is a, a stamp of, uh, showing a, from Austria showing a clock. And from a high-level point of view, and there, some of the slides will get into the weeds, but I would encourage you not for this purpose to get into the weeds, but uh, to think about um, the biological clock really has a lot in parallel with, the, with a traditional clock. Now, again, most of us don't use wind-up clocks like this anymore, but I think it's illustrative because there are analogous uh, physical aspects and structures uh, to the old-fashioned wind-up clock. For example, there is um, output, and the let's see, I'm not working so well. The output is on the clock is uh, in the hands of the clock, whether it's showing hours or minutes or seconds. And there are ways that our biological clocks have an output and demonstrate things. There's an input to the biological clock. And in fact, the more that scientists are learning about it, just like you know, there is one dial to set uh, on this, on this anal analog clock, there's a dial to set what time the alarm goes off, to set what time the clock thinks it should be at any certain time. Uh, there's also inputs to, um, uh, to give energy to the clock and to give energy to the alarm. And in fact, these are part of the human and uh, animal clock as well. The inside is not at all simple. Uh, and just like in an analog clock, there's all these different parts and gears. And it's certainly even more so uh, inside the uh, biological clock. Nonetheless, um, there are some general principles that uh, can go over. So this biological clock. Um, is, exists in our brains. And uh, this is a sculpture by Gerstein called The Last Moment. And indeed, there is a representation, in fact, many representations of the outside clock within each one of us. Why does this uh, occur? Well, if we think back to the beginning of time, since, uh, the, since the very beginning, uh, every creature, uh, every species of life, at least on the surface of our planet, sorry, uh, has been uh, circling the sun on an annual basis, uh, the moon circle, circles the earth on a 30-day basis, and the axis of the earth is spinning around on a daily basis. And the sun being the central source of light uh, and the central source of energy to this planet is something that has provided a stimulus uh, to every species of life on the surface of the planet. And I'd uh, love to show this slide from Arthur Galston's uh, book on biological clocks. Uh, this, this shows a picture of the detour, the, the commonly called the angel's trumpet flower. And the angel's trumpet flower has a biological clock so that uh, every night, if you will, it goes to sleep, it closes its petals, and at dawn the petals start to open, they get wider, and full bloom in during the whole day. And of course, uh, as plant scientists uh, began to discover hundreds of years ago, uh, this is regulated not just by the sun which sets the time, but it's also regulated by an internal biological clock. Put the plants in darkness, and these uh, plants will continue to 
for at least several days to continue on the same schedule of gradually waking up each morning, opening their petals to the sun, even if it's not there, and then closing them up. And I, I love this slide because I would argue that uh, it's this uh, biological clock, the sensitivity to um, light in terms of changing the timing of the biological clock, the waking, the sleeping, this uh, it could conceivably in some ways be the most fundamental form of behavior conserved across every species of life on the surface of the planet in different ways. But all of us, you know, when we psychiatrists and psychologists talk about behavior, we have many different kinds of complex terms. Freud wrote books and books about them, but the core one, I would argue, is this fundamental biological clock that in some ways wakes us up and puts us to sleep every day. And indeed, sorry, um, the biological clock affects not just plants, but it affects um, all kinds of animal species and we humans as well. Now, there are some caveats for this presentation today. The first one I write TBD, to be determined. And that what I mean by that, uh, there are literally thousands and thousands of details, uh, more being discovered each week, and as science could and, sh and should do, some of the things that we thought were true 20 years ago, we learned 10 years ago are not true, and some of the things we think are true today over the next couple of years will surely be disproven. The next point, things are not so simple. Um, it's very, for, for teaching purposes, uh, it's the job of professors to simplify things. The reality we are always finding is more complicated. The other um, caveat for today is that most of what I'm going to be talking about is that is, I'm going to present in terms of what is known about mammalian species. There are a lot of commonalities with non-mammalian uh, animals, um, but I'm, I'm going to focus more on mammals, including we humans. So this is the weeds. Don't get scared by it. But what I want to uh, uh, emphasize is the three different parts of the biological clock that are known and operate within humans. First of all, there is the input. The primary input to the biological clock is light. Uh, again, this is not the only input, but light is the strongest input. Light, especially for purposes of resetting the biological clock of a blue light, 460 to 480 nanometers, enters through the eye. And again, we'll come back to this. This is uh, an oversimplification. The light from the eye uh, sends signals through the neurological tract to the internal part of the, the major core of the biological clock, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which is in the hypothalamus. I'll say more about this later. Then neurological si signals are sent from the um, SCN to the paraventricular nuclei down the spinal cord, and we'll come back to this, and signals eventually go up the spinal cord to where the body starts to generate the major output that we can uh, detect. So we don't have uh, we don't have hands of a clock, but we have production of the famous hormone melatonin, which is largely, not exclusively, but largely made in the pineal gland and then circulates into the bloodstream. The melatonin that is produced from the pineal gland both travels through the body and gives signals to the rest of the body. It also goes back through the bloodstream, back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus where there are melatonin receptors and uh, can reset the clock itself. But we'll come back to more of that later. From an anatomic point of view, let's look at some of the uh, major players with regard to the brain. So we have, you know, the eyes are not shown in the brain, but the eyes send a neurological pathway um, through the optic chiasm. This is where the left eye and the right eye optic nerves meet, and then send tracks to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is a uh, a set of nuclei right on top of the optic chiasm in the hypothalamus of the brain. Suprachiasmatic nucleus, and I really prefer to call it nuclei because there are two of them, um, and it's really a collection of thousands of individual cells, uh, is the master clock for the body. And again, the signals go down and up the spinal cord, and eventually, with regard to the melatonin output, uh, the melatonin is largely produced in the pineal gland, which circulates melatonin uh, through the bloodstream to the rest of the body. Now, um, one thing, one uh, particular reason why I appreciate being able to give this um, a teaching talk today is because it does give me a chance to uh, pay homage to three 
uh, of my mentors and, and my, who, who I learned a lot about, great scientists and great human beings who are part of this organization. So I'll, I'll mention their names in particular. So this slide uh, was adapted from uh, a paper that uh, Tom Ware and Norm Rosenthal, sitting here in the second row, who I have the great privilege to work with at NIH, um, prepared uh, with regard to seasonal affect dis affective disorder. And this shows that pathway that uh, I talked about previously. Again, the sun being the primary input to the biological clock sends its signal of light to the eyes, especially to the retina of the eye. You see the neurologic pathway going to the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, then to the paraventricular nucleus. And again, this is oversimplified down the spinal cord to the intermediate lateral nucleus, back up to the superior cervical ganglion, and then uh, through a neurologic pathway to the pineal gland. So this gives uh, a, a rough outline, or actually a detailed outline, of the key neurological pathways. Now, the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, uh, play a critical role in terms of synchronizing peripheral clocks. What I mean by that is that the more people have looked for biological clocks in the body, the more that they've found them all over the body. Uh, in fact, uh, you could say that our bodies really in many ways are a collection of biological clocks, um, with the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, being the master clock, but at the same time there are other clocks, for example, the thyroid gland, you can see circadian rhythms, circadian being 24-hour rhythms of different hormone production from the thyroid gland, the SCN sends signals, um, at least via melatonin, to myotubules in the skeletal muscle, again, 24-hour rhythms. Um, the pancreas is regulated um, with the biological clock. Again, you can see 24-hour rhythms. These, are, these diminish over time because this is in a model where the light was taken away, so just the internal clock stays true for several days before uh, it stops uh, cycling without the uh, the light structure, the light stimulus, skin fibroblasts as well. And this is really just uh, a starting list, but these are all kinds of output. Now, one key point to make is that the talking, the connections between the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the rest of the body, these signals of timing are both through humoral, in other words, through blood chemical um, components and through neuronal pathways. Now, the SCN, the suprachiasmatic nuclei, um, uh, one, are really fascinating. One of the ways that we know that they have a, uh, that they uh, convey humoral uh, outputs is that this uh, was, is based on a study by Tucson and Meisel, published about 10 years ago, where they established in mice that cyclic information from the hypothalamus was lost after the SCN was ablated. So let me show you what's going on in this slide. So this is a stylized suprachiasmatic nucleus, and you can see it has a 24-hour rhythm of output, both electrical activity and in uh, chemical production. When the suprachiasmatic nucleus is removed, is, is ablated, the output, the 24-hour output, circadian output from the SCN is lost. But when you take a graft in these mice, of an SCN, put it back in, um, the 24-hour rhythms could be restored. Now, what, the, what work um, published by Silver et al. did was that they took these uh, grafts and encapsulated them, so preventing neural outgrowth, and they were able to show that by a non-neural connection, not by nerves, but by humoral factors released from the SCN, 24-hour rhythms are still able to be produced in the body. So uh, not, uh, it's not so different from other aspects of human physiology where there are sometimes uh, multiple uh, parallel or redundant pathways for similar purposes. There are other factors also that regulate the peripheral clock. So uh, how much food we eat and what time we eat, our locomotor rhythms, what time we're waking up, with what we're doing exercise, can affect biological clocks body-wide. Let me go on now to the inner mechanisms. And, uh, um, 
of the, uh, specifically of the superior chiasmatic nucleus, the superchiasmatic nucleus. Now, this is uh, an oversimplified uh, slide. It was once presented as truth, not by me, but by the people who presented it. But again, truth becomes more complicated as we learn more about it. Traditionally, the superchiasmatic nucleus is considered to have two subdivisions to it. Um, a dorsomedial section, uh, a shell, and a core or ventral lateral section. To a large degree, the dorsomedial section receives non-photic, non-light input. This is a place where the melatonin receptors are. The ventral lateral, situated right next to the optic chiasm, has uh, neurons that receive light-activated input. So this is where phase shifting, changing of timing of the biological clock takes place. These SCN is composed of literally thousands of independent cellular oscillators that are coupled into a neural network. One of the, uh, I think, neat findings that's been discovered in the last couple of years, and this is a slide from Buer and Ben Gelder from two years ago, was that they were able to establish um, how the SCN regulates itself. Because remember I mentioned that it's composed of thousands of individual clocks. Well, how do those individual clocks get on the same page? And it turns out that we have a peptide uh, called LHX1, and it uh, is produced in the SCN, and it produces coupling pep peptides to make circadian rhythms. And if the production of LHX1 is stopped, the circadian rhythm is damped, and the SCN's consistent rhythms are limited. So this provides very good evidence, and because LHX1 is uh, unique to the, at least thought today to be unique to the SCN, uh, this is thought to be uh, what helps make this clock different from all other clocks in the body. And it turns out that light that can cause phase shifts, and we'll be talking more about this this morning, but it's light that's able to change the time of the body clock has a specific effect of suppressing the production of LHX1. So it's really a, a rather fascinating system. When light that can, can cause a phase shift uh, is shined on the organism, uh, the LHX1 production in the SCN is suppressed, which makes for a less coordinated SCN and allows the SCN to shift more easily, to cause a phase shift. Now, within the SCN, GABA is the most common neurotransmitter throughout. These two nuclei, one on each side of the optic chiasm, separated by the third ventricle, communicate both by synaptic junctions and by release of vasointestinal uh, polypeptide. Now, the SCN is thought to have a major role as being an irradiance detector. And it gets its input, and we'll come back to, us, to this, from different signals that uh, are together added up or uh, integrated from a molecule in the eye called melanopsin from rods and cones. The SCN has cells that are acutely stimulated by light, and it also has cells that are acutely inhibited or silenced by light. In other words, there are some cells that are turned on by light, some cells that are turned off by external light. And one of the, again, findings from the last couple of years of the literature that I've found most interesting is one, one question that I've always wondered is, what is it biologically that makes a daytime animal, a diurnal active animal, uh, different from a nocturnal animal. And I'm sure more and more will be learned, but one of the interesting findings is that daytime active animals are thought to have relatively more cells that are turned off by light. So um, this is, I think, a very important biological finding. Now, light activation and light inhibition of SCN cells is a function of light intensity, how bright the light is. It's a sigmoidal um, relationship with a working range specifically centered around the light intensities of dawn and, and dusk. In other words, the SCN, the superchiasmatic nuclei, is particularly a day versus night detector, and it's very sensitive, and we'll come back to this specifically to the light levels that occur at around the time 
of dawn and around dusk. So again, Michael Terman's done tremendous work with Dawn Simulator, and that's what may be one of the reasons why this is, is an effective treatment, because the signal to the SCN uh, is, particularly, uh, uh, is particularly sensitive in the SCN at times of dawn and dusk. Interestingly also, the SCN is only really sensitive to light-induced phase shifting during the dark phase. So in the middle of the daytime, and we'll hear more about this this morning, um, the SCN is not really sensitive to changes in the biological clock. Behavioral activity um, correlates with uh, electrical activity in the SCN. This is mouse data from uh, Hoban et al. from seven years ago. The SCN also retains a memory for photo period. What does that mean? It means that, again, as I talked about the plants, that if you turn off the light, the plants will continue to wake up and go to sleep every day for several days. Um, if you put someone in a cave, um, we will continue to wake up and go to sleep at similar times for at least several days because we have a memory. And similarly, that memory is kept in the suprachiasmatic nuclei uh, especially. We're going to hear, I'm sure, a lot more this morning about the PRC, the phase response curve to light. This graph, uh, it's a complicated graph, but the key thing to show for now, and, and you'll, you'll see more later, is that, sorry, we have, um, during the daytime, the effect of light on changing the time of our biological clock is relatively little. But during the dark hours of the night, in the first half of the night, Shining light, which gives a signal to the SCN, causes what's caused, called a phase delay, where we wake up later. In the latter part of the night, bright light applied to the person, to the eyes, causes a phase advance. So what's going on inside the SCN that allows these things to happen? So this is sort of uh, the, the inside part. Essentially, and again, uh, um, this, is gonna, this is available in most uh, common textbooks. This is adapted from Writer and All, 2010. Um, I think this will be, although you're not supposed to take pictures and videos of this, this will go on the web through New York State Psychiatric Institute, so you'll, you'll have access uh, to this. But ba basically, the signal from the eye uh, tells the SCN to synthesize genes and lead, and I'll share a bit of that in a moment, leading to the signal going to the paraventricular nuclei to the intermediate lateral cell column. Now, the genetic story inside the SCN, um, uh, I could talk about, or someone who's truly expert in it could, talk, could spend a day talking about it and not be half done. So what I want to share for the purpose of this teaching course is a, a really simplified molecular model of the circadian oscillator. Uh, in the SCN. So essentially we have a 24-hour period, a 24-hour clock within us, and we continually have, we have production of transcription factors, um, in particular clock and BMAL, BMAL1. As the levels of these transcription factors go up, they lead to the transcription of genes that are controlled by the biological clock. Some of the more prominent uh, ones are PER1, CRY2, CRY1, uh, CRY2. When you get extra high levels of these, you trigger a negative feedback loop, which then reduces the production of clock and BMAL1 so that you have a continual rise and fall. And again, this is a far simplified, but it, it gives you a sense of the basic pattern for how the clock is working within the SCN. And um, what I consider to be a, a really a, a Fascinating finding, a mutation in the PER2 uh, gene has already been associated with familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. So this is uh, a familial advanced sleep phase syndrome uh, is a disorder, a genetic disorder within families where people uh, typically wake up several hours early compared to the rest of the world each day, go to sleep several hours early, and it's not, a, it's not within their control. It's not a, it's not a voluntary uh, phenomenon. It is genetically driven. And the fact that you know, today we can link, uh, at least in some families with this, um, this disturbance to a genetic abnormality in the biological clock is really a, a beautiful uh, work in science and I think a, 
a great model for all of us who uh, are trying to con connect clinical phenomena and clinical disorders to the biological clock. Um, certainly the literature is, you know, one of the reasons for our field and for this organization has been to try and um, unlink, or I'm sorry, to, to unleash the um, connection between uh, the clinical disorders and the biological clock, but it's, it's not always so easy uh, to do that. So again, this uh, graph from the, the Ware and Rosenthal paper, so in, uh, I've gone over it before, but it relays again the pathway. And this is something from, from a take-home point of view, it is worth having a general understanding of this pathway from the eye to the suprachiasmatic nucleus and the hypothalamus to the spinal cord and back to the pineal gland as far as the inner workings of the biological clock. Now, in the pineal gland, one of the major jobs of the pineal gland is melatonin synthesis. Um, fascinatingly, melatonin is a hormone of the dark. Uh, whether you're talking about uh, a bat that's active at night or a human being that's active at day, um, all, uh, all mammals, all animals um, that I know of produce um, melatonin specifically at night. So it's not a marker specifically of behavior, but it is an internal marker of the external environment. Uh, for today's purposes, we don't have to go through, you can do this at your leisure if you're so motivated, the exact chemical pathway within the uh, pineal gland that leads from the norepinephrine signal to the gland to the production from tryptophan and into serotonin, into melatonin, which is then released into the capillaries. The melatonin released into the capillaries, it can go back to the suprachiasmatic nucleus um, through the third ventricle to in a negative feedback loop. Um, the, there are melatonin 1 and melatonin receptors throughout the body. Melatonin may also, and melatonin is a very uh, lipophilic molecule. That means it's a very fatty molecule, so it can penetrate inside the cell nucleus, potentially of every cell in the body, and have uh, additional uh, effects, which remain to be proven what they specifically are. Uh, throughout the body, but there are uh, well-described melatonin and melatonin, melatonin 1 and 2 receptors. It's not Michael Terman, but uh, that's a good way to remember it. You can see that uh, it nocturnally some animals tend to produce melatonin more during uh, the, sh the long nights of winter, a shorter, uh, shorter melatonin production during the short nights of summer. The melatonin 2 receptor is uh, argued to be sleep promoting. Uh, it's not within the scope of this talk, but there is extensive debate and discussion in the literature about is melatonin a sleep prom promoter, is melatonin uh, a good uh, sleep medicine or not. I, I will throw in my two cents here just as a, a way to rouse people and then uh, if anyone wants to comment on it, they can do that later. My, my own personal reading of the literature is that melatonin uh, can pr at least immediate release melatonin, the kind that the body makes, can promote sleep, but it promotes it at times of day when we don't have circulating melatonin. So if you wanted to take a midday nap, it might be a very useful tool. Um, the, the, the evidence showing that its efficacy is good at nighttime is uh, very limited and uh, extremely debated. It's a highly controversial issue. There are slow release forms of melatonin which may in fact be uh, very useful for uh, bedtime uh, for sleep as well. All right, let's say a little bit uh, about the uh, output. I, I mentioned the peripheral rhythms in the thyroid gland, the skeletal muscle, the uh, endocrine pancreas skin fibroblasts, um, but in addition, melatonin and the biological clock output shows up in brain activity, heart rate, blood pressure, renal uh, function, general metabolism, immune, feeding, body temperature. I mean, it seems to be the more that people look for circadian rhythms in different aspects of our biology, the more that people are finding them. I'm going to finish by talking uh, about uh, the input um, to the <laughs> biological clock. So again, here, um, this shows, especially with regard to phase shifting, changing the time of the biological clock, light of uh, blue visible light uh, acting on melanopsin uh, through the retinal ganglion cell, these are critical to clock setting in the suprachiasmatic nuclei. But rods and cones are also 
uh, thought to provide input as well. So it's again the story, the more we learn about it, it's more complicated than it's first stated. First it was stated that rods and cones were responsible for it. Then it was stated that melanopsin is responsible for it. Now it seems that there are multiple critical inputs. And again, our behavior response to light is so complex that um, we may do ourselves a disservice if we just attribute our, all of our behavior to one or two molecules. Now, melanopsin, uh, it's an active area of research. There are uh, at least two critically important me forms of melanopsin, one called um, 11 cis retinal melanopsin. This is the structure of, a, of the chromophore melanopsin. Chromophore is a word that refers to the part of a molecule uh, that absorbs light. And you can tell because it has all these uh, pi bonds alternating double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond throughout um, biology, wherever you see a molecule like this, it tells you that this molecule is capable of absorbing light. It doesn't tell you that it's physically, physiologically important, but it, it tells you that it has that capacity. And there are two what are called bistable forms of melanopsin, the cis retinol and then uh, trans retinol and trans -ret basically light of about 467 nanometers causes this part to flip up to become the trans form. 476 flips back, causes light, uh, causes the molecule to flip back like this. What the specific role of each of those two different wavelengths is as far as our biology remains to be determined. There may also be at least a third form of melanopsin that may play a critical role uh, as well. With regard to the eye, this is a, a slide of a monkey retina and uh, and if you imagine that the source of light is at the top, this is the front of the eye, this is the back of the eye, light comes in through the front, goes through several different layers. Near the front is the ganglion cell layer where the retinohypothalamic tract, uh, photosensitive uh, ganglion retinal cells, these are the melanopsin containing cells, make up about 1% of the cells in these layers. Light goes through to the rods and the cones and you can see lots of blood vessels at the back of the eye as well. Now, work done by, by Walmsley et al. published in PLOS Biology last year shows that the um, uh, signal to the eye, it's not just a matter of brightness, but it's also a matter of color detection. It turns out, you know, we have different kinds of uh, uh, rods and, and cones specifically in the eye that are more sensitive to one color than the other. And because the change in the amount of yellow versus blue light uh, is particularly important at times of dawn and dusk, it turns out that it's not that our eyes are not just detecting the increase in light but the change in color and that provides a clear signal to the SCN that the body is waking up. Um, this is work um, I, I've been able to praise, Michael, I've been able to praise uh, Norm Rosenthal. This is work by Gooley et al including Bud Brainerd who uh, a, a giant in the field, also part of uh, one of the founders of this group. This, uh, this work that they published a few years back has shown that there's more than melanopsin, however, that meets the light in the eye. Uh, they did work where they looked at two specific wavelengths of light, a blue wavelength and a narrow green wavelength, and they found that both the blue and the green lights were equally uh, effective in turning off mel mel melatonin, because that one thing that light does, and this is work shown by Al Louie, uh, in humans, light can turn off production entirely of melatonin in the body. And um, what Gouli et al. found was that the effect of green light it's, it's strong initially, although it decays over time. But they found that the time-shifting effect of the green light cannot be explained by melanopsin alone. And indeed, um, the, the, we, we learn about more and more molecules. The work of Ramey, Where's Justice, uh, Juan and Michael Terman, Tassini and Menneker led us 20 to 30 years ago to see evidence of an autonomous biological clock, a light-sensitive clock, in the retina, even independent of the SCN. And, um, and one of the things that's just been discovered, uh, published in papers in the last couple of years, is that the biological clock in the eye um, can be entrained to light even in the absence of rods, in the absence of cones, and in the absence of melanopsin. Uh, in the eye, the in retinal entrainment was most sensitive to ultraviolet A and violet light. And work done by Buer and Van Gelder uh, has shown that another mo molecule, another light-sensitive molecule called neuropsin in the retina ganglia cells, that may be this particular molecule required to be the photosensitive 
molecule to mediate these effects uh, in the eye. I'll just take two minutes to look uh, fur further beyond into uh, my own particular interest of something that I've called humoral phototransduction, the idea that there's a conservation of circadian and seasonal responses between plants and animals. It grows out of the idea that plant chlorophyll uh, has, this is, its chromophore is virtually identical to the light sensitive part of human hemoglobin. And indeed, this is not just a, a uh, chemical coincidence. Uh, they're in fact formed, plants and mammals form these molecules along the same biological pathway, starting out with delta amino levulinic acid as a precursor. Um, plants get magnesium added to the center and go on to become chlorophyll. Animals get iron added and go on to make heme. Also, th this is beyond the scope of today, but uh, the heme in plants and animals um, gets converted to biliverdin, and then plants use that to make phytochrome, which is perhaps the most important time-setting molecule in the plant. We use it to make uh, bilirubin, which, um, at least when I was in medical school, we were taught was a wasteful, was a waste leftover product of evolution. Um, it turns out that light causes the dissociation of carbon monoxide and nitric oxide from the heme of hemoglobin. And um, one of the things that I find fascinating, I'm putting up again the slide from Gooley et al., where they showed the importance of blue and green light. Uh, I should say that um, there are, you know, the, what color light works best for SAD is a source of, of great uh, discussion. There are some papers arguing blue, some arguing uh, green. Certainly no one can argue with the usefulness of white. But one of the fascinating things is that um, what's causing, how is this green light having an effect? And at least in photobiology, one common understanding or one way of doing the research is to be able to link a particular biochemical effect to a particular wavelength. And it turns out that the peak wavelength for this process of causing heme to release CO, that peak effect occurs at 540 to 570 nanometers, right in the same region as the green. So whether this study is proving that cones are having this effect, or could it be hemoglobin CO dissociation, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's something to think about. And the proposal of this model is, in fact, that gas neurotransmitters are produced in the eye, go back through the retinal vessels to the cavernous sinus, and I should say the cavernous sinus is neither cavernous nor is it a sinus. It's, an, it's a network of veins that wrap very tightly around the internal carotid artery, which um, could easily allow for transport of gases like CO and NO directly to the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which is r right there. Um, and in fact, in the 20 years since this, has been, this model has been proposed, uh, it has already been proven that the following chemicals, GnRH, ACTH, LH, da 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 all cross through countercurrent transport from the cavernous sinus into the internal carotid arteries at this place. Some drugs even do that uh, as well. I could speculate that intranasal ketamine may be having some of its effects uh, via this route as well. Uh, data that supports this model include the work of Kozurowski et al., published four years ago, where they showed that in a pig model, in a seasonal hybrid pig model, they showed that there were elevated levels of CO in the eye blood uh, versus the veins in the, uh, in the daytime, not at night, only in summer, not, no difference in the winter. And, if, and in a plug for you to come to my poster tomorrow, we have some preliminary data showing uh, in the pig model, venous CO increases following 5,000 lux light exposure. And as I see Michael standing there, I see I'm out of time. So, um, any questions? Norm. So, in any event, I would just like to personally compliment your thoroughly engaging and to say that one theme that came out from you was the theme of when you find a biological function that is important. Thank you. As circadian rhythms, when something is as important as circadian rhythms, there's not going to be one pathway that is going to be responsible for orchestrating such an important function. 
and you've shown this obviously in many different aspects. I, in turn, working in a clinical research uh, situation, have similarly seen that. For example, uh, Tom Ware and I, and I don't know if you were there at the time, but we did an eye versus skin that was before my time. study where we looked at whether the effects of the antidepressant effect on seasonal affective disorder were mediated by the eye versus the skin, and the eyes uh, won in that particular experiment. However, there is now extensive evidence that um, UV light on the skin actually has euphoriant effects. They're suggesting that it may be beta endorphin related through uh, melanocytes and uh, certainly tanning salons anecdotally and experimentally have been found to be uh, beneficial, although of course they're, the cost of the skin cancer risk is not worth it. So there you get redundancy in skin versus eye. Um, a conversation that uh, Martin and I were having yesterday reminded me of a patient I had, um, blind, who had had her both eyes enucleated because of um, cancers in the eyes, who retained a very clear, uh, and this was done very early in, in life, retained a very clear seasonal affective disorder pattern. So whether that was coming through light or whether it was coming through some non-light mechanism, I don't know. Thank you. I can't argue with anything you said. <laughs> we have a few minutes for questions, debates, clarifications. Yeah, I'm wondering, uh, hi, my name is Stefan, I'm a PhD student, um, and I'm wondering, as a student, I didn't read the paper by a writer, but um, why is the pathway going all the way down the spinal cord and going back up? Is there a reason for feedback or something? Or Yeah, I, I've asked that question myself every time I, I see that slide. You know, I, it, uh, I, if one is looking, I mean, I think it's, it's natural and it's, it's appropriate to look for um, evolutionary teleological kinds of ex explanations. Uh, I, I don't have the answer. Someone else may. No, but, but, but it's, a, it's, it's a very interesting question, I think, and really would be, would be worth pursuing. I mean, I, actually, on the subject of questions, Norm, you're bringing up the eye versus skin study. I, let me make one uh, uh, plug in, in that. That was one of the studies that got me so interested in, in this field because it, there was a, a very clear hypothesis um, with a very clear, um, s the study had a very clear hypothesis and a clear result was being uh, explored. And s so often in the work that we do, we are just gathering data, we're just, get we're stamp collecting, if you will. And to the extent that we can have precise hypotheses to try and show something true or false, whatever the outcome, I think it, it advances the field. So. Yeah. 